you're gonna to wanna to pay extremely close attention. The rules are changing, and if you don't know this information, you're more likely to be on the losing side than the winning side. I'm really excited about this. Dean Graciosi, Mike Thilsane, Katrina Ruth, Brian Dice, the one and only Russell Brunson, Sonia Riccati, we have Molly here, Hot Brown, Roland Fraser, Mike Dillard, Jeff Walker, Neil Patel, Dennis Hughes. And I think that there's a high risk of mass extinction of the internet business. Millions of businesses, big and small, closed, pushing us into the worst global recession in history. The writing is on the wall because right. things are changing, things are happening. Change in the industry that's forcing people to evolve and adapt or basically die. You need to see this to understand it. Something like that will happen. You can write it in blood. If there was a tactic or strategy that you were most excited about, what would it be? We can go as deep as you want. I call this content sprouting. These strategies work for any social media platform. If you believe it's a good idea, you should stick with that. When your business becomes part of someone's identity, that's when they stick. This is really crazy. I don't know if I ever shared this with you. Waste the least amount of money to find that winner. That's how you win for a dollar a day. Now, I have people that are on my list for two years that are still opening the emails. To get this many amazing people in a room, just amazing. We're about to take you behind the scenes. I love what you're doing here, this is amazing. If you want to know what's happening in the future, tune in now. Hey, so welcome to another live stream. In this live stream, what we're going to be talking about are strategies that you can take, triggers that you can deploy, um, cognitive biases that you can leverage to immediately make a difference in your campaigns, your launches, what have you. So uh, my name is Rich Sheffrin. I do these live streams twice a week, uh, Tuesdays from 2 to 4. Eastern time and on Thursdays from 6 to 8 Eastern time and we spread them out because I uh, had requests from many of you from all around the world uh, to try and spread them out to make the times more convenient so that uh, at least one of those times you can make during the week. So along those lines I'd love to know who I'm talking to today if you're hearing my voice or watching me I'd love you to say hi let me know where you're from uh, it's always much more enjoyable for you as well as for me if we make this as much of a dialogue and not a monologue in addition to that um, I don't use these live streams with any kind of underlying agenda to get you to buy something or to get you to do something. So along those lines, what I ask of you is that if you can comment, if you can share this video, uh, I greatly appreciate it. That's the payback that you can give me for taking four hours a week, 200 hours a year uh, to dedicate my time to these live streams. And as long as that continues, as long as that happens, then I'll continue to do them. And if not, then I'll stop because uh, obviously I can invest those 200 hours into lots of things and uh, it only makes sense to do this from an entrepreneurial standpoint as well as a marketer standpoint that if those of you who get value uh, share it and it's not so much that whether or not you have a big following and uh, and therefore whether that share matters or not it doesn't matter at all in fact uh, even if you have a small following, even if you have no following, if you're sharing it on your page, it tells Facebook that uh, this is something that might have other people interested in based on the number of people who are sharing it. So that's how you help me. That's how you let me know that uh, the topic I was talking about, the content that I delivered was worth your time. And if it was worth your time, then obviously, hopefully you think it's worth others uh, people's times as well. So with that said, uh, last 
last live stream was kind of an interesting one on Thursday. I, um, I've loaded it up to YouTube, but I haven't released it yet. I will do that tomorrow. And it was kind of a riff on certain hidden addictions that prospects have. And uh, based on the questions that you guys were asking me, it kind of took me down a direction of sharing how I've done a lot of how I've leveraged, for example, the one sentence persuasion course in the manifesto, in the entrepreneurial emergency, how I've used the shift in context uh, in other reports like the Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2. So during last week's live stream, I was discussing all of those things and uh, I mentioned in passing that uh, I had this whiteboard and I'd have a lot of things on it a lot of triggers, cognitive biases, et cetera. And um, I don't remember who it was, but someone was like, oh, I'd love to see that. And then there were some more of you who chimed in. And so I thought, why not? Let's do that. I still am, I want to say hello to everyone. So you still have a chance to tell me hello and let me know that you're here. But before even going there, um, I wanted to, what was it that I wanted to share? Um, Hmm, I've drawn a blank, so I guess we will say hello to everyone first. Um, oh, I got some other cool stuff I'd like to share, too. So, hey, Kayvon, good to see you, my friend, and Christy. Uh, long time no see. So glad to see you, Christy. Um, steal our winners. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, uh, I love that promo, and we're going to be finally selling it again. So, um I think we'll be actually doing some advertising starting today or tomorrow. Uh, Matt has already put some campaigns together and was asking my opinion. And I said, well, uh, my opinion is I'd like to ask Maxwell Finn his opinion. So sent him a text. And uh, as soon as his baby falls asleep, um, we're going to do a conference call where he can go over what Matt has in store for uh, the documentary series, that series that uh, we just ran an ad for. So that should be kind of fun. So uh, Donovan, uh, let's see what this is all about, Rich Sheffrin. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, what about you, Donovan? Where are you from? And is this the first time you're joining in? Or is this, uh, you just are now finally found your voice and are willing to speak up? Uh, Andre, really excited about this live stream. Very cool. Excited to have you here. And uh, Brian from Houston, nice to see you, Brian. Isabella, uh, happy to see you too, Isabella. I hope you saw that on Instagram. I liked some of your stuff or did it in Facebook. I don't remember where, but somewhere. Um, I tracked back one of your likes to one of your pages and then started liking some of your stuff. So I hope you're doing well, Isabella. And Hugo from Miami. That call is going to be scheduled today when I talk to Maxwell Finn. So just letting you know that. And hey, Renan, uh, hello from Brazil. Very cool. You know, uh, we are uh, pretty close at this point to being live with Inversa um, down in Brazil. That's our licensee down there. Uh, Clint from New Zealand, re reading to drink from the fountain of knowledge. Very cool, Clint Gray. I love that name. That's a very cool name, Clint Cray. Uh, Mignon Note Smith. Barna Zoldarf. I guess you're telling someone else to log in or something. Uh, Anne Marie. Hello from Long Island. Wow. You know, I grew up in Long Island. Um, that's where I'm native from. So uh, Great Neck, New York is where I grew up. Uh, John Williams. Hey, how's it going in California? Man. I hope that you guys don't have another lockdown like you guys have kind of led the way in lockdowns. In fact, I just got off the phone uh, with a friend of mine, Wes Watson, and uh, you know his business has been on fire the last year. And I think it's only a matter of time until wealthy people, people who are doing well, get the hell out of Dodge. Because uh, who wants to give up 18% of their income for the wonderful experience of living in California when you could spend 160 days there and pay them zero. Uh, and uh, then I just finished a Steal Our Winners interview with um, 
John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, who lives in Puerto Rico, who only pays 4% federal tax, which is mind-blowing. And uh, for anyone making a lot of money, uh, the amount that you save is pretty significant. Uh, you know, so something to consider. Although uh, I actually have a friend, another friend here. I know I'm just bouncing kind of around here, but this helps my mind kind of get situated by dumping it all on you guys and kind of then clarifying and being streamlined. But uh, I have another friend, David, who is been living in South Beach. He just rented a hotel, uh, like a Ritz-Carlton hotel room uh, suite uh, up in Palm Beach, just trying to determine where he's going to live next. I'd love him to live in Delray, uh, as I would like most of my friends to live in Delray. I think that would be pretty killer. But uh, he's actually considering Puerto Rico because uh, if he stays in Puerto Rico, it's a lot cheaper to get a NetJets account and fly to Florida or wherever as many times as he wants over the course of the year than it would be paying federal taxes. So uh, there you go. Uh, Let's see. Best wishes from Germany. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, Isabella. So are you guys doing crazy lockdowns over there? I know Europe is kind of a mess. Uh, I'm so over all this. Um, I am so over all this. Uh, I don't plan on locking down at all. In fact, I traveled most of COVID. I don't have any older relatives that I come into contact with. And so therefore, uh, and the only uh, older gentleman that I ever spend time with on a consistent basis would be Mark Ford, a.k.a. Michael Masterson. He's already had it. So um, because of that, I feel pretty comfortable that I'm not going to be a super spreader. And I'm excited about that as far as not being willing to lock down my life anymore. And I just got to say, I know this is not politics, and I try and avoid it as much as possible, although I do briefly mention things here and there. Uh, New York cannot go through another lockdown. They will decimate all the other small businesses that are still left. Uh, I was in the clothing business. I know what having stores is, or in the hypnosis business. I know what having a service business is in New York. And I can't imagine, like, if I sell at my retail stores in New York having been closed for as long as they've been shut down to have two seasons ago's inventory and pay be paying rent is just a recipe for disaster. So, uh, yeah, kind of crazy that we're even considering another lockdown. Imre, hello from Budapest. Well, hello right back at you, Imre. I don't know if we've had many people uh, log in from Budapest, so glad to have you here. Uh, Hello from rain-soaked Highland Beach. It's really sunny here now. Is it raining over there? Because it was raining early this morning, but not since uh, I jumped in my office. Uh, Coming at me from Canada. So hello, Andre. Good to see you. Don, good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, So good to see you in in Ohio. Ready to get locked down again. It's already starting here. So crazy. I don't think it's starting here. Florida, I think, is like, I don't think Florida's going to go. Uh, it's a Republican governor. I think he's going to tell the president or the new president to stick it. <laughs> and I hope he does. Uh, I know I have no interest in, uh, Kim was trying to get me to fly up to New York for Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I ain't going back to New York, period. Have no interest in being in New York City. Definitely have no interest in uh, potentially getting Trapped there like I did last time. Uh, Hey, Lisa from Miami Beach. Good to see you. Uh, The value shared here is out of this world. Well, thanks, uh, Renan. Uh, Jane Adler from D.C. Good to see you. I should actually put the comments here so I don't have to keep looking away. There we go. And uh, hello, Asher. Good to see you. And Cam Fats is in the house. Good to see you, my friend. Donald Powers, good to see you. Luis from Mexico, good to see you. Isabella, uh, thank you for the likes. So great. That's cool. Uh, First time joining in. Used to follow you a lot of your content when I first started in 2007. So uh, how has life been since 2007, Donovan? Uh, Things working out well? Did my advice steer you in the right direction? I hope it did. And uh, you look like you're a happy couple there. So good for you. Um... Always the best content. Thank you for giving back. Thanks. 
Uh, Orlando, Florida. Hey, Donald. Good to see you. Um, I'm on Inverse's list waiting to see your name on those emails. Cool. Me too. <laughs> I got to check in with them, actually. I got to send them a text uh, in the next couple of days. 3.15 in the morning in Singapore. Well, then you are a committed soul if you're in Singapore, uh, which I assume you are. Uh, COVID-19 getting bad here in Ohio, according to the news. Yeah, well, um, I don't remember what I was listening to last night, but something I was listening to last night was talking about the spike somewhere, and that spike somewhere, I forget which, 80% of the people who have died are over the age of 80, which is past life expectancy, and I just, it's hard not to believe that there are ulterior motives with all this. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this is not, we don't know the whole of it. That's all I'm going to say. It does not seem like we know what's going on. Uh, And what is scary, though, is that, you know, you have someone like Mark Ford, who's 70, who gets it and is fine three days later. And then you have others like, um, well, I don't know if I should say his name, but other friends of mine who are in their 30s who are younger than me in better shape than I am, and they get it, overcome it, but then have like a two-year path to get their full lung capacity back, which is kind of insane. Um, hello, Nina. Good to see you, uh, as always. And Dr. Vogelman. Ah, uh, yeah, that kind of sucks. That kind of sucks. Um, you need to have me in Delray. Uh, in Germany, the lockdowns are crazy, same in the U.S., but with many Germans shouting at you to keep the distance, they are so rude here. Yeah, that's uh, that happened to me in South Beach. I, I was walking down the beach uh, without a mask on, on the beach, and uh, some woman came running over to me to yell at me for not wearing a mask. I told her she's in my six feet. And I'm not putting a mask on and get out of my six feet. Um, But uh, maybe I'm just a little bit more belligerent. Uh, Mark Ford, a.k.a. Michael Masterson. How is he? Didn't know he got COVID. His writing is awesome. Yeah, his writing is awesome. Uh, I generally spend every Friday night with him uh, at his cigar bar. Uh, Brought my friend Mike Zappi with me this past week. Mike Zappi is the... Uh, source of psychedelics for the stars. Uh, He's been written up in Forbes and a bunch of other magazines and really at the forefront of using psychedelics for uh, overcoming depression and things like that. And uh, so I thought he'd be an interesting person to bring to this group uh, for some really interesting conversations. And I was not let down. It was a great night. Uh, Hey, Lloyd. Good to see you from Wales. And Carlos from Venezuela and uh, Jaden, how do you get customers to a new web design business service? Uh, well, it really depends. And you know what? It, that does remind me I did. Let me see if I can just load up my photos here because I did take a photo of something that did kind of remind me of what, what a good USP different but point of difference that actually matters uh a good example of that so i want to see what was i looking at that had me think that way oh by the way i got uh you can't really see him i got my tats on um all right let me just see here where this might be uh let's see is this it nope oh there it is um so what I would say to you, Jaden, and we can get, ask me that question again, if you don't feel I'm, I've answered it, but ask me after we've kind of dove into the stuff that we're diving into today. But um, what I would say is that you have to have some, something that makes you different and makes you different uh, than others in a positive way. And so last night, for example, I went down this rabbit trail and uh, I'll show it to you really briefly here for a second. Let's see if I can show it to you. Yeah, okay. So 
Um, this was from Nootropics Depot. Not important, except, right, that um, I was, what was I doing? I was uh, trying to fall asleep, actually, and I was listening to podcasts in the background. I'd already done a hypnosis session from uh, Paul McKenna, uh, a former acquaintance of mine who I knew back in the days of New York, who I think is one of the best hypnotists out there, also a fellow NLP uh well, he knows more about NLP than I do, but obviously I studied NLP as well. And um, I listened to his 30-minute hypnosis session. I did a meditation session. I still couldn't fall asleep, so I put on a podcast. And one of the podcasts was someone had mentioned David Sinclair and David Sinclair's uh, interview on Rogan, where he mentioned that he was taking over a gram a day of NMN. And for those who don't know who David Sinclair is, uh, he's been on almost every podcast and every YouTube podcast and every YouTube video show that you can imagine. David Sinclair is a professor at Harvard and a researcher at Harvard. If you've ever heard of uh, Reservatrol or Reversatrol, however you pronounce that, that was David's research that shot up wine sales, red wine sales, about 30% uh, when research came out that... uh, Red wine had reserve trial. Anyway, so he talked about taking NMN. And NMN is a precursor to NAD. And uh, there's also a, I forget the name of nicomide riboside, uh, which is, um, what's the brand name of that? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Expensive, though. Expensive pills. I forget uh, the name. That's uh, these two compounds, both not inexpensive, uh, have been shown to increase NAD. And that's where you get all your energy. And so there's this like big anti-aging front. Anyway, so I decided, screw it. I got to start taking this. I actually just took my first dose this morning because I got it. I ordered it and I got it already, which is kind of shocking. But anyway, um, as I was decided that I wanted to buy this, right, this NMN, to start supplementing it. And I take a gazillion supplements. So uh, for those of you who don't take many, don't assume that this is wonderful just because I'm taking it. I take lots of things. But, uh, but I came across this, and, it, and I, wanted to, I took a picture of it, right, because I was looking at different capsules, Right. I was looking at different. I was looking at powder. I was looking at sublinguals. And then I came across Nootropics Depot, who I I buy a lot of stuff from Nootropics Depot. So I like them. And they talked about it being a coded tablet. And I'm like, well, why? What does that matter? And so I clicked on it. And then it told me why it was a coded tablet. It immediately changed the buying criteria. And this is why I took this picture. Right. It was different in a way that would made it better, right? Different is better than better first, right? But then that point of difference has to provide some kind of benefit to the consumer. So this is a perfect example of a USP, right? That they offer coded NMN, NMN tablets. And because of that, right? It has, and why do they do that? Because it has lackluster stability right? It can be broken down with stomach acid. This way, with this coating, it's more likely to get into your bloodstream. I'm not trying to sell you NMN. I'm not even trying to tell you that you should take it. Um, What I am trying to just point out is that this is a USP. And Jaden, you need a USP. You need some reason why people should choose you over all their other options. All right. So let's keep going so I can finally get into this. Florida looks good. D.C. and Maryland, not so much. Yeah, Jane, come on down. I mean, look, I lived in New York most of my life, um, and I loved New York. I don't love New York now. I think it's going to be a decade plus until New York is ever a good place again. We're going to need another Giuliani to clean up the mess that de Blasio has made and Cuomo has made. How hilarious that he's writing a book on leadership when this one guy is responsible for more COVID deaths than any single human being on the planet. Uh, And anyone who has older relatives who died in New York will affirm that. And so, uh, yeah, you know, 
I not not betting on New York right now. Jason, hey Rich, turning in from ta- tuning in from Tampa. I see you posting to Instagram recently, but I haven't seen any SOWs on Instagram. Are there plans on adding Instagram to an SOW issue? As far as Instagram strategies, if so, Jason, um, yes. Uh, haven't really. Who would you? Well, what I would say is, is that um, I am adding a bunch of other contributors. Uh, I've been focused on that recently. And if you have certain people that you think are the bomb when it comes to Instagram, let me know. I will reach out to those people and I will interview them. Uh, I want to kind of expand the universe of people I'm interviewing. And also I want to expand the um, the areas that we cover too. So yes, Jason, I just need some guidance as to who you think I should be looking at. Heading to Florida in a couple of weeks. Well, if you're in this neck of the woods, let us know. Uh, Delray is right north of Boca Raton in between Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach. Uh, Rich, here's some black magic, black magic black hat persuasion techniques. That's what we're going to do. I just got to get to my slide. Uh, speaking of New York City, I'm here. 10 p.m. lockdown now for restaurants and bars. Insane. And I think we're doing so much damage to children. I just, I, I boggles my mind. Uh, I have a co I have a co-working and I'm almost 90% of my revenue with lockdowns, almost six months to get half of it back. And rumor has it, there might be a second lockdown after elections on November 30th. I guess it depends on who wins or not, right? Uh, we have friends who are ER nurses. One of them would like to punch out the next person who calls COVID-19 a hoax. Yeah, it certainly isn't a hoax, but neither is the flu. Neither is pneumonia. Neither is any of these things. And we don't lock down the whole country and put every other small business out of business for that reason. And that we don't prevent kids who are much more likely to die from the flu than COVID, period. There is no dispute on that. Yet we are, we keep the schools open for flu. We have closed all the schools for COVID and we have, we are doing psychological damage to our children because they need socialization at the age of five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, etc. So that's where my perspective is. Uh, good on you, Rich. It's likely that COVID is primarily an inflammatory vascular disease, hence the variability in long-term symptom patterns. Reservatrol, yes. I used uh, binaural training with a Zen 12. It takes you deep down very quickly for meditation to go to sleep. The best I've ever used, and I've used a lot. Um, I actually, I don't where is it? Where is it? I have, uh, oh, it's in my kitchen. Um, I use binaural beats as well. Um, Mind Gear sells a Bluetooth eye, um, eyeglasses that sync with the binaural beats and I can run any hypnosis session through there. We used, um, we used light and sound machines in my hypnosis clinics, you know, 20 years ago. So very familiar with the technology. Uh, I used to sell as a pharmaceutical rep in Houston, essentially enterically coded tablets were always a big seller. I don't even know if it's any better, Chris. It was just, and it might not make any difference when it comes to NMM. It's just that it was a great example of me, a consumer, in search of making a selection of who I was going to order from, and um, and that kind of raising a red flag, like, oh, geez, maybe I need to think about this. So that's always the best uh, kind of point of differentiation, one that makes you consider all the other people that you've looked at as maybe missing something. I love New York. I loved New York, I'd say, past tense. Uh, Optimism for the... uh, See, the problem with that is, and I know people might not be interested in this, and if you aren't, I apologize. Um, The problem is, Chris, to for that, um, it takes a lot of money to open a store or restaurant or bar or anything in Manhattan period. Like when I had my retail store, a million and a half dollars in inventory, I'm paying $40,000 a month in rent. So when you sign the lease, you got to put up 80 grand 
in security deposit, another 40 grand for the first month. That's 120 grand. I got to then buy a million and a half dollars worth of inventory to have in the store. I then got to buy the cash registers, the racks, everything. So when you want to open a store, you got to reach into your pocket for 2 million. You want to open a restaurant, you got to reach into your pocket for a million. The small business owners have lost all their money. And so that money is no longer there. And so how are these new businesses going to, who's going to fund all these new businesses? Is Amazon going to, and we're all going to just work for Amazon? I don't know. But like, I know that entrepreneurs everywhere have been decimated. So I don't see the optimism for the empire state because I don't see who's rushing there with money to open up something. And I, and the people who live there have lost a lot of their money. So if I was a betting man, I would be betting against. I'd sell. Uh, hey, Ron, great to see you. Amen. 100% with you about your thoughts with COVID-19. Uh, our schools are open with COVID precautions in place. Very low incidence here in Out Island. Live your passion, though. Um, try setting up a business in Paris. I know. That's where my sister lives and my brother-in-law. Um, and they're on lockdown now too. And, um, look, they said that, uh, Florida was going to be a shit show because we didn't lock down and, uh, that didn't end up happening. And I think, well, last thing, then we get to it. The comments are there, so we're good to go. Uh, the world health organization, which I don't really have a lot of trust in to begin with, but they're anti lockdown. They've said lockdowns don't work. About a month ago, they came out. They said we shouldn't do lockdowns. So now why are we doing lockdowns? And if you post to YouTube about it, like now who do you follow? Because now like it used to be against the rules. You could get you could get kicked out of YouTube, demonetized, etc. If you went against the World Health Organization. Well, now our government's going against the World Health Organization because the World Health Organization is anti-lockdown. We're going into lockdown. Now what do we do if we post to YouTube? It's a mess, right? Um, so anyway, so here is the slide that we were talking about. It was in the background of the, of the slide that I used for this video. So let's take a look at it. And now let me see if I can zoom out a little bit. Trying to see. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So there you see some of what's on here. There's more, as you can see. But, uh, and what I would say is, is that I didn't choose this one for any particular reason. And what I mean by that is, is that uh, when I shared this, when I shared that a fact that I had a whiteboard like this, um, what I mentioned was that my favorite type of marketing, the favorite type of launches that I like to do personally is one that is not pre-done ahead of time, which if you know me makes sense. It's the reason why I like to do live coaching programs, sell that, then turn into a program because me left in a vacuum is just never a good idea and I'll never finish anything. So same with a coaching program, same with a marketing campaign. Doing it all in advance to me is very difficult. Um, however, I superly, like majorly, like I can't even uh, convey to you how much I feel this way, that, um, that I so enjoy doing a more dynamic, um, campaign or launch. And what I mean by that is, is that I have, I know where I want to take people, right? But I'm going to engage the market through videos like this, through blog posts, through emails, etc. And I know where I need to take the market, but I am trying to engage people. And then as I engage, get into a dialogue with the market and then move the market. Right. So in essence, right, uh, let's say I, I know I'm, I'm going to create to market a coaching program on theory of constraints. 
I know that I got to get people to understand that it's their constraint, not their potential that determines their success. And I know that I can't just drop that and then say, here's a coaching program. So I got to take people down a path. And during that path, I am going to have a conversation. It's like going to a bar and trying to pick up a member of the opposite sex. Um, someone just texted me. Uh, and, uh, well, gee, nope, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, let me go back to me. Um, and uh, it's like going into a bar trying to pick up the opposite sex and having a whole script that you plan on reading. The likelihood of that being successful is kind of small as opposed to kind of knowing what it is you want, engaging in the conversation, and then figuring out during the conversation that uh, during the conversation, maneuvering and moving the conversation in the direction that you want. So with that said, let's kind of look at this board now. So the idea is, is that each day kind of wake up, kind of look at the feedback that we've gotten, the comments on the blog post, the comments, if we were doing it today, like in Facebook, uh, on the video uh, here and in YouTube or wherever. Right. And so I would have, so what I was saying though, is that each time I would do a campaign, I would put a bunch of stuff on the board. So there isn't a single board. This is a picture of one of the boards that I used at one point and probably can tell which one it is. I might be able to tell which one it is based on um, what we see here. So with that said, let's take a look. So let's take a look at the... Um, We'll start at the top left, right? Or at least my top left. I hope it's the top left for you. So the first one is reinforce biggest benefits, right? That's a reminder to me that like of the benefits I've already kind of clarified in my own mind and talked to prospects about to consistently reinforce those. And what that means is, is to provide um, concreteness to show people actually what benefit they would get from that benefit right? Um, one of the best ways to do that is, uh, to take any benefit that you have, uh, and then put so that after it and then fill in what comes next, right? So this great new article strategy will get you to dominate the first 10 listings in Google right? That might be the benefit. So that, now the benefit of the benefit, so that each and every day, new customers are flooding into your business. And the best part is you're not paying a penny for them, right? Whatever the benefit is, so that, right? So I might be doing some of that. I might be, if we're talking about procrastination, I might talk about how lucky I was that even though I normally procrastinate, I used the strategy today, got stuff done, and lo and behold, my good buddy Wes Watson or Kim, my girlfriend, or someone gave me this great invitation to do something great. Normally, I would have had to have said no because I would have I would have been procrastinating all morning, and then in the evening, I would have had to have done that. But instead, I was able to hang out with Joe Rogan all night because they, were, they invited me, and I had gotten my work done earlier. You never know what price you're going to pay by procrastinating today, I would have paid a huge price because I would not have been able to have met one of my heroes. That never happened. I'm just kind of making up a story, right? The, the idea is, uh, the idea is right, is to get others to see how they're not handling and getting the, not handling the obstacle, not handling the benefit, uh, actually is interfering with their life. So easy one, reinforce the benefits. Next one, tie into money. Now, this might be obvious to many of you, right? But ultimately, I teach entrepreneurs and I help entrepreneurs grow their businesses through marketing strategies, through systemization, through strategy overall. And because of that, um, I have to, and I've shared constant times on these live streams that money is not the biggest motivator for me, but I recognize 
that money is the biggest motivator for everyone else in our market, right? And I'm not, that's not a, um, I'm not making a character assassination on anyone. If I'm buying something for my business, then I am thinking about how much is this going to make my business. So tie into money, and then it says they need to see the money right next to it, is a reminder to me that every time I need to remember that whatever I'm talking about, whatever benefit I'm talking about, I must tie it back into money. And the way um, an old mentor of mine used to talk about it, his name was Ken Glickman. Uh, he used to be involved in boardroom quite a bit. Uh, he was like, Rich, they got to smell the money. They got to smell the money. How are they going to smell the money? Like, I get it that you want to teach theory of constraints, but how are they going to smell the money from that? And that was always my job, right? Of having to make that connection for people. Okay, next, intensify the pain, right? And um, and by all means, guys, feel free to throw questions at me uh, on anything I've covered already or any even anything as it relates to what we're talking about here because, as I've said, always uh, more better if it's a dialogue as opposed to a monologue. I'm just plugging something in. Hopefully, this doesn't make my machine blow up. There we go. Um, so... With that said, uh, let's keep going. So intensify the pain enough, right? Now, um, let me share with you my perspective uh, on marketing versus selling uh, because I think that in order to appreciate what I'm saying here, yes, I think it's pretty obvious, intensify the pain, right? You know, most people have heard of problem, agitate, solve, right? Or things like that. But... From my perspective, you know, I, I take the famous quote by Peter Drucker that the goal of sell, the goal of marketing is to make selling superfluous as really my goal, right? And so how do you go about doing that? Well, you first have to kind of, in your own mind, distinguish from what is marketing, what is selling. Because if the goal of marketing is to make selling... Uh, superfluous well then you have to have definitions for marketing and selling and there's literally thousands of definitions none of them agree on what is marketing what is selling so i don't think i'm going to be able to give you a definitive uh definition for that but i can give you mine and so what i believe marketing is um marketing is teaching your prospects how to value your product or your service, right? It's teaching others how to see the value in what it is you're providing. I think of, so another way of saying that is to establish the beliefs that your solution is the right solution for their challenge or their goal, right? And we've talked about how Every market is made up of a group of people that share conflict. That conflict is either a problem unresolved or a goal unattained. And so everyone in the market shares this conflict and they didn't have the conflict yesterday, right? So when we're marketing, what we're trying to do in my worldview, right? I'm not saying this is the right worldview, the only worldview. This is just mine. Uh, this, these are the definitions that I operate with that allow me to do what I do. And uh, so... In marketing, I want to help people value what it is I'm offering. And the way I do that is I shift certain beliefs. The other reason is that I kind of think of selling. Now, granted, I'm not a great salesperson. So that might be maybe my definitions are a little askew because of that. Um, but that selling is really pushing people out of the status quo. And the example I like to give people is that... Uh, my weight fluctuates, right? Right now, this morning, I'm like 198. Um, I've been as high as 250. I've been uh, as ripped as 170 or 165, 170 at this size, right? And so obviously at 170, I'm 30 some odd pounds lighter, uh, but same frame. So I'm pretty ripped at 250. I'm a size 44 inch waist with a 30 inch inseam, uh, kind of the wrong way, right? <laughs> uh, much wider than I am lengthwise. And uh, the thing is, is that because I'm 
198 right now or whatever I am. Um, right now, I'm not feeling, I'm in my status quo. If there was a really good piece of cake here with me right now, I'd probably eat it at some point today. If there was some great ice cream, I might eat it, etc. But when I get to a certain weight, generally about 205, 210, I start to panic. I come out of status quo. And now it's time for me to really get serious about getting my weight back down. And then I'll get my weight back down to somewhere in the 90s, maybe in the 80s, maybe in the 70s. And then things loosen up again, right? And so we walk around with lots of things that we may be dissatisfied with, but not dissatisfied with enough to actually take action. Hence, status quo, right? There's something called in marketing or not marketing, just in cognitive biases, status quo bias, that there's a bias that keeps us in the status quo. And so I look at marketing as setting up the beliefs so that when it's time for selling and we push someone out of status quo and they go to take action to solve the conflict, that they then go in the direction of the beliefs they have, which are the beliefs we've established in the marketing campaign, right? So... Let me know if that makes sense to you, that marketing is teaching others how to value your product, right? We're going to do that by shifting beliefs, and we're shifting beliefs so that when it comes time to sell, right, um, and we're pushing someone out of the status quo, they, they will follow their beliefs, and their beliefs have already been established in the marketing. So with that stated, right? What you might not have ever heard, that I, hopefully is not that revolutionary to many, if not all of you. But what might be is that um, there are several ways to get people out of the status quo, right? So certainly one way is intensifying the pain, right? So therefore you see that point intensified the pain, parentheses, enough question mark like have i done that enough are people are am i getting people to really start wanting to get out of the status quo because one way to push people out of status quo is to make the pain more real that can be by making the consequences bigger right the sacrifice is bigger the problem bigger right uh etc that's one way to to push people out of status quo. Another way to push people out of status quo is to is to show people an easier way to solve the conflict, an easier way to get rid of the problem, an easier way to attain that goal. In other words, like if someone comes to me and tells me, so one of my favorite desserts, right, are rainbow cookies. You know, they're like the chocolate outside with the three colors on the inside, rainbow cookies. I love those, right? I don't know why, I just like them. And so if you came to me and told me that there was a way that I could drop 20 pounds, go from 198 down to 178, by just eating rainbow cookies all day, well, now the pain hasn't gotten any worse, right? But because the solution is easier than I expected, it's also push, it will push me out of status quo. So you kind of have this balance, right? Prospects kind of have this balance. And these this is the price I'm paying, right? This is the work I'll have to do to stop paying the price. If we make the work all of a sudden a lot less, now it doesn't make sense to have the problem anymore. We might as well take action. Or if we make the pain much higher, we make the problem much bigger. It doesn't make sense. But I assume that when we're talking to a prospect who's in the market but hasn't bought, that these are they're in status quo at the moment. And so because of that, I need to, one, intensify the pain, two, make the solution seem easier. So, hence, intensify the pain. Now, the next one here is 
uh, this changes everything. And I think I mentioned last live stream uh, that that was something that I used to ask Todd all the time when we worked together. I'd be like, explain to me how this changes everything because that's the response that I want prospects to have when they come across what it is that we're offering or what we're talking about or what we're planning on launching. In other words, that what really creates a viral effect is when a prospect says to themselves, this changes everything. In other words, now I'm going to be successful. Now I'm finally going to get to my goal weight. Now my business is finally going to be at the level where I want. Now I'm finally going to be able to overcome procrastination. Now, whatever the now is, right? This changes everything. What you have, what you're offering, the strategy, the approach, the concept, whatever, the program, the service will change their lives, will change everything. And it's not what we are saying. That's why it's in quotes. This changes everything. What am I doing to get my prospect to say that? This will change everything. Um, all right. So I'm going to keep going, but I would love to hear what you guys. Oh, okay. There's some. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Um, all right. You can try the rainbow cookie diet so that you can happily lose 20 pounds in just six weeks. Order now. <laughs> uh, I don't believe you. How can you intensify the pay for someone who might be guarded against a pitch, which he or she is expecting? Well, they shouldn't necessarily be expecting it. And you have to do it in a less than transparent manner. Like... One of the beauties, one of the problems I have, and it's, I'm not going to argue with its effectiveness because it's incredibly effective. I'm not going to argue that it's not effective. I just don't think it's as effective. Is that like when you invite someone to watch a video and then they go to a page or a mini site that has four videos and the first one is unlocked and the second one's going to be unlocked in three days and the third one's going to be unlocked in like a week and the fourth one is coming in like a week and a half. We know what is going to occur. Pretty much everyone knows what's going to occur. First one's going to be the what. The second one's going to be the how and wow. And the third one's going to be the proof. And then the fourth one, you are the people who don't know any better are expecting another video. And really, it's the sales pitch. So I don't like being that predictable. I don't like people knowing like, oh, this is all a pitch. It's one of the reasons why you separate marketing from selling because it's much harder to establish beliefs when someone knows that they're in a sales conversation. So because of that, we want to keep them separate and distinct. And you can intensify the pain by stories, by new research, by a ton, by uh, like what I said, Right. Like talking about how in the past I would have had to have said no to these great opportunities. But today I was able to seize upon this great thing because I got my work done in the morning, which was something I was never able to do before. That's talking about a positive. Right. But like in the lives of people who procrastinate and have had to say no to stuff. Uh, it intensifies the pain. Does that make sense? Let me know. Mm. It's a little hot here today. Sorry about that. I'm shiny. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully that helps, Asher. If it doesn't, follow up. I'm glad to answer whatever question you have there. Uh, what a great live stream. Really appreciate it, man. Cool. I'm glad you're enjoying it because whenever there's not as much back and forth, I wonder if I'm just like uh, in my own little world or if you guys are getting value out of it. Can you intensify the pain so much that you turn people off? How much pain is the right amount? Um... I, I, I'd be hesitant to say, no, you can't, right? But what I would say, uh, Christopher, is that you can certainly talk about the pain way too much, right? Like that, and I've see, I see that quite frequently. Um, if you can nail it and articulate it well, you don't need to drone on about it. So there is that. Uh, but can you... Yes, I guess from a standpoint that um, you have, right, you have one objection, which is my situation isn't that bad, right? And then you have the other objection, which is my situation is hopeless. And we've talked about that before 
uh, and how, like, if they feel their situation is hopeless, it's going to be hard to get them to buy. However, if they also feel like their situation isn't that bad, it's going to be hard to get them to buy. So, yes, you can intensify the pain too much. But generally, it's more about permanency of the pain than it would be intensity of the pain. That would be a challenge. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Chris. If it doesn't, you know, you know the drill. Um, I've thought about putting together a beer and pizza diet. Most people won't read the book or follow anyways, but it has an appealing pitch. Haha. <laughs> yeah, it does. If you lose weight by it, it's not if you gain weight by it. Although I, I have friends who have a hard time gaining weight and I'm like, all you got to do is follow me and just eat whatever I would have eaten. And you will put on weight very quickly. Um, <laughs> Rich, how would you divide, differentiate the roles and responsibilities of a marketer versus a copywriter for a marketing campaign? What is the crucial, key crucial a marketer must provide a copywriter so that you can have a higher probability of success for the campaign? Well, this is a back and forth issue, uh, Hugo. So I wouldn't say that there are, I'll give you my opinion on it. And... Um, it's one of the things that it's one of the reasons why I'm still a consultant to Agora. So Agora doesn't have a lot of good marketers in it. In fact, Agora has very few good marketers and I can count on one hand, uh, the good marketers at Agora. Now it would take me more than both hands and both feet to count how many good copywriters there are at Agora. And that makes sense because Agora started out when pre-internet, and so it was direct mail, and you don't do any marketing really with direct mail. You have list experts, right, who are renting lists, compiling lists, etc. And then you have the copywriters, and that's it. And so Agora, for a very long time, has really just focused on copy, and it's gotten them very far. However, uh, the divisions nowadays that do the best at Agora are the ones that have a marketer in it. And one of the best examples is Legacy Financial, which I think is the division that's grown the most as of recently. And that certainly is props to Fernando Cruz, Ryan Markish, and Amber. Um, the three of them really are the triangle, but Fernando is the copywriter. Amber is the admin, and Ryan is in charge of copy. And so uh, let me just look at the question again. I know we're talking about marketer versus copywriter, but uh, more specifically. So I will tell you a story about a shitty copywriter named Harlan. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so here's what happened. I wrote the manifesto. I created the U diagram. I did all that. And uh, he was not paying attention to the launch. And so he wrote copy that was actually very much in conflict with the launch as much as he would like to claim otherwise. And uh, just to tell you how not plugged in he was into the launch, he wrote a very opportunity driven sales letter, which would make no sense since I railed against opportunity seekers for a month and a half when I released the manifesto. So he was unwilling to change the copy. And so I had to call an emergency teleconference with a bunch of other copywriters that he admired and respect, all to tell him that his copy was shit and that it could not be used because he wouldn't listen to me. And on that call was Clayton Makepeace. On that call was John Carlton. On that call was Brian Keith Voiles. And I don't remember who else, but several other copywriters. And they all told Harlan that his copy sucked, that it didn't make any sense with the launch. And so I understand what it is that you're saying. And so uh, the copywriter has to be plugged in, obviously. Um, but the copywriter should be paying attention to what resonates with the market versus what doesn't. And if it is day-to-day -day marketing where it is dynamic, then whatever observations would be shared with the copywriter, at least in my situation normally, uh, in that very first launch, it was Dan and I, Dan, Karen, and I that did all the writing even though many people would like to take credit for it. Um, but in future launches, when I did stuff, Dan went on and did his own thing. Like he moved on. He was my right-hand guy early on when I first started. Um, but uh, after that, I generally was working with a copywriter 
because just because I would decide what the next move is by looking at this board and deciding like, okay, we're going to go with this. I might write a quick rough draft or I might speak a quick rough draft. But if we're doing a lot of stuff and we're in the middle of a launch, the last thing that we want is for me to now write an email that might take me an hour and a half to write that a copywriter can bang out in 10 or 15 minutes because I'm certainly not fast. So I would say that um, ideally the copywriter is involved, very much involved in the marketing because it's still the language of marketing, right? Like, it, you know, I grew up in the world of accounting and uh, the way it was always described to me and the way I like to describe it to others was like accounting is the language of business. And I believe that to be the case. But if accounting is the language of business, then copywriting is the language of marketing. And uh, you could have that be an outside copywriter who doesn't have much involvement, but then you run the risk of like what I had with a copywriter that likes to take credit for stuff that they've never done and also feels very arrogant about their stuff being great. And then I had to get all these legends to come in and rip that person apart and tell them how wrong they were. And fortunately for me, I saved that call, just in case this video ever gets to where it might. Anyway, uh, can you tell us more about your writing process during a launch campaign when you're doing it live? Um, well, so on a few of my launches, I would work with Clayton Makepeace. So let me see if I can find something here. Uh, you know, my site is not fully... Um, there's a lot of stuff yet that hasn't been updated on the site, but let's see. Uh, all right. Damn it. So I, I, what I was looking for, which is crazy. Um, what a bummer. Um, so I had this post that talked about Rich Sheffrin is a big fat fraud. And, um, yeah. I don't see, I don't see, uh, let me see if I do a search here. Big that fraud and what I was going to do was I was going to explain like the process of how that blog post got created but I don't know that um, right now I'm missing so many posts on my site like the Billy Mays marketing one that got me so much traffic so I'm not really sure why we're missing all those and I haven't gotten a chance to speak to Matt about it um, so okay so I would I would uh, so let me tell you about this one, though. Rich Sheffrin is a big fat fraud. That was the title of a blog post I wrote. So what happened was that the day before, Milos, um, on the blog, right, this was during uh, the Attention Age Doctrine 2, I believe. Yeah. So it was during the launch of that, which launched the home study of the Business Acceleration Program. And someone uh, didn't like that, if I'm so wonderful, why am I charging for the course? Why don't I just give it everyone for free? And I'm like, well, you know, that always happens. People want, uh, they feel like you should just give them everything for free, even though I was giving away a lot of wonderful, good advice and information during the launch. So that got some traction. A bunch of people responded, like a few people took that person's side. Then a bunch of my people, well, not my people, a bunch of other people took my side. And and so there was a little bit of a back and forth until my followers drowned it out the naysayers. OK, so that was what occurred. So now the next day, it's like, OK, that's what occurred. How do I leverage that to advance the conversation? So that's kind of the first question that I have in my head, right? That I need to answer. Well, the first question could be what has occurred over the last 24 hours and how can I leverage it moving forward? So, right, I'm teaching about attention 
and here's someone upset that I'm not giving away my stuff for free. And, um, and so now it gives me the chance to kind of bridge that, right? So the first step is like me recognizing, and I'm just going to see if I have it in like potentially big fat fraud. Um, what a bummer. No, I don't see it here. Um, yeah. So I, I, I understand that this occurred on the blog. I'm trying to get people to recognize that one, the world of attention is changing. I already released attention age doctrine one that said attention is going to become the scarcest commodity online. The second, the attention age doctrine two had already come out. And in there, I was talking about people's attention is now going to go towards social media. And what are the implications of that? And part of the implications, one of the biggest implications that I, even to this day, I, I don't think people really get or don't move their marketing around is that prospects are no longer just a target. They're actually your best channel. And so that was in the manifest that was in the attention age doctrine too. And, uh, and fortunately I had already cut ranks with Mr. HK, or he probably would have taken credit for that one too. Anyway, that was the big, like that was one of the big ideas of the attention age doctrine too. Like what are the implications of social media? And one of the implications is, is that prospects are no longer just targets. They're also now your best channel. So now like I'm able to pull that in, right? So now I have this person ask like, who's tearing me up on my own blog. My prospects come in to save me. Um, and now like, I have to write something, but like, I know that the majority of people don't go to my blog. So even though I might've had a couple thousand people hit my blog that day and several hundred comments, I'm talking to a list of, I don't remember how many at that point, maybe 300,000 people or something. So I get the chance now to alert everyone to what occurred and how this illustrates my point, right? That, and so I wanted to show you that one because it was so well written because I didn't write it. Um, I wrote like a generic one, sent it to Clayton Makepeace, and then Clayton rewrote it talking about like um, a virtual uh, bar fight with whiskey bottles being broken on the bar at, between my prospects and the ones taking aim at me. And it was this whole long story. And so that eventually became the piece, right? Now, my piece was decent. It just wasn't written like with great word choices and creating visual images. And certainly Clayton was a master at that. So that would be the process. I've certainly done numerous ones by myself, done ones early on, like where Dan and I did it. And, uh, um, but that would be the process, right? Each morning kind of figuring out what are the messages we're going to send out today based on what happened yesterday, knowing where we want to take people, and then trying to bring it all together. Let me know, Milos, if that makes sense. Uh, it's what I always thought of a word of a wand search. It involves me asking them questions to help them discover the depth of their own pain rather than me telling how bad their situation is. Yeah, I don't like people assuming anything about me when I'm in a, uh, when I'm being sold something. I like people to ask me questions, but as soon as someone tells me they know me or they know what I'm struggling with, the next thing I know is almost always going to be wrong and I'm not going to be happy about it. Wound search, that is. Got it. Value. I hope that means I'm providing value. <laughs> um, Black Friday is coming. Best way to approach that event, the email sequence. You know, Kurt, I appreciate the question. Um, I don't know that I, I necessarily have the best answer for you. I, I've, you know, it's always, and I think I've mentioned this on other live stream. Well, I've definitely mentioned this on other live streams. I assume you haven't heard it because I, um, 
don't recognize you, but I'll, I'll share what I've said before because I believe this to be the case. I think I'm one of the best in the world at selling what people don't think they want. I think when it comes to selling people on what it is they know they want, there are literally thousands of marketers who are much better than me at that. I've just never done that of any consequence. Like if you look at all my major products, people weren't out there looking for steal our winners. They weren't out there looking for a coaching, a business coaching program when I developed it or the theory of constraints when I developed it. So I'm much better at selling things that people don't know they want. Um, so what I would say is that and this, and I could think of a, I could think of a bunch of examples where this wouldn't necessarily be great, but you asked, and so let me answer. Um, I would say having a, I think having a waiting list would be a good idea. So you take like, and I think there should be some curiosity as well as self-interest built into that. So you're taking your most valuable product or something, right? And you are going to be putting that on sale. You don't want to take away from sales from all your other stuff. So you don't necessarily, I think you don't, you don't tell them everything's going to be on sale. Cause then like I'll wait a week and now your sales go down for the week, unless you don't sell things every day. But then, uh, but I would cause a waiting list where people have to opt in. And, um, and then that gives you a sequence to just talk to those people. And so now you can kind of, You've never given a discount this big before. You hope you don't sell out too quickly. Because of that, those of you who are on the waiting list should be congratulated. You're definitely going to get locked in. But if you drag your feet, other people on the waiting list could box you out. You know, so that's kind of how I might go about that, Kurt. And I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Can you sell a high ticket product with emails like Travis Sago does? Of course I could. Uh, Jay does it all the time. I used to do it before we invented the automated webinars. Uh, do you always go for pain versus pleasure opportunity side of the equation as a rule? I go with pain. I, I there are, um, and I, when I say pain, like, I'm, I'm, I'm problem focused and the implications of that problem. If you want to call that pain, then yes, it's not always pain though. It is problem centric. And it's, you know, I would say that one of the early books I read on selling was spin selling back like 20 plus years ago by Neil Rackman situation, problem implication. I don't even remember what N stands for. Uh, but, uh, but, situation what's currently going on what's the problem and what are the implications of that problem and that's generally uh how i go about it yeah i had a sales letter that talked about the top eight reasons why your practice is killing you and what you can do to fix it uh yeah i would say that uh christopher depending on how long those eight reasons are you might be like overdoing it, but if those aren't easily agreed to, uh, kind of intuitively obvious, then it might need to be said. So it's not about like the number of reasons as much as the much space is dedicated to it and then what opens up from it, if that makes sense. I'd say a Black Friday is an offer-driven campaign where people expect to get a steep discount, but I don't know that it will have a specific approach to an email sequence, my two cents. Yeah, that where I think an email sequence comes in, Andre, is if you can build up to something very special being offered and only being offered X number, and then you'll sell out. So you got to get on the waiting list now. And when the waiting list fills up, you know, uh, because we're only going to take triple the number of people. We're going to take how many we have to offer times it by three. And that's the number of people that are going to be on the list. So it's very possible that we might sell out pretty quickly, even from the waiting list, right? That's kind of how I would go about that. Andre, the don't do what I do diet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would lose weight. They will gain weight for someone who can't gain weight. And all they have to do is eat what I would have eaten 
like last night when I got woke up and I, well, not when I woke up, when I couldn't fall asleep, my default is then to eat and feel bad for myself. I didn't do that uh, last night, but normally I would. And so that person would normally would now would be the time I would eat two pints of ice cream. Since I'm not going to do that, you eat the two pints of ice cream. Uh, yeah, they would, that would be the don't do what I do diet. Um, basically you instill pain by talking about how they have wasted time, energy, and with other things and not gotten the intended result. Are they going to continue to do things this way or try out a proven system? Yes and no. I mean, it, there are a lot of ways to skin the cat. I don't want to oversimplify that, Jaden, but certainly the way that you're talking about it is true. That would certainly work. And, and I'd be foolish to deny that. What I would say though, also is that the more that you can get them to conclude that they've wasted time and energy and effort, that this way of doing things is easier, that they would be more certain to get the success using this easier approach, that they've wasted time, therefore, using this wrong approach, and that they're saying, man, I wish I would have come in contact with your stuff a year, two years, three years ago. The more you can get them to think that before you have to say it, hence revelation before explanation is what I always teach, um, that's kind of the idea there. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> uh, the Harlan story is totally believable to me. Yeah, he likes to leech on to other people's success and cause conflicts. Uh, thank you for introducing me to Clayton Rich. Meeting him was so memorable. Yeah, what a nice super guy. I can't believe he's no longer with us. Uh, still... To this day, um, ouch. Oh, thanks, Troy. You rock. Um, and I don't take that for granted. But to this day, let's see. I don't know if people can see it. Um, let's see. No, you can't really. Can you? Nah. Anyway, if you could see my phone... The first name on my favorites is Clayton, which obviously I can't call anymore uh, since he's passed away. But uh, there's no other dead people on my list, and I don't know that I'll ever. I don't know that I'll ever uh, delete him because that's how important he was to me. And thank you, Troy. You rock. John Waller, petition against advertising scams. Yeah, that wasn't it though, because it was actually I saw that, and. Um, I don't think that's it. Um, can I? Yeah, I can't even copy it. Um, let's see. That petition was really kind of cool. We got a lot of people, and it went kind of viral quite a bit. Uh, not super viral or anything. But, uh, yeah, I'll have to log in. I'll find it, and I'll share it with you guys some other time. I love my advocates far better than my buyers. Yeah, of course. They help you get more. Hey, Priya from Israel. Good to see you. Bottle breaking fans. Yeah. Uh, oops, not that one. Nope. Uh, Rich, can you bring on Travis Sago? I've heard he is really good. I don't know, Travis. Uh, I bought something of his a long time ago. I could certainly look into it. I'm going to write that down. Hold on. Um, one person I just reached out to, uh, actually right before this live stream, who texted me during the live stream because he made an appointment to talk to me later today, even though I asked him not to and said for later in the week, cause I can't talk today, um, is Jay White and Jay White used to write a lot of story based emails for me back in the day. And so I thought it'd be cool to have him and steal our winners, maybe jump on one of these live streams with me as well. Uh, so that'll be the first person or the next person that I focus on email with, but I certainly can uh, reach out to Travis as well. And if anyone knows Travis, let him know that I plan on reaching out to him and he can always reach out to me if I don't get to him as quickly as he hears this. Um, interesting, I've had copywriters telling me that how I 
how do I know that the copy is not going to work if I haven't tested it? Others have told me that the copy is a good enough to start with and it doesn't have to be perfect, which I agree to a certain extent, but I do not agree what that means to them. My point is that the whole relationship could be messy. I'm trying to learn a better way. Okay, so, well, there's a couple things here, right, Hugo? So one is, is that like in that particular instance that I was talking about with the person whose name I don't really want to mention anymore because it only puts me in a bad mood. Um, and to think... I got him started as a copywriter. I took him to his very first copywriting seminar as a guest um, out of the goodness of my heart. Uh, goes to show that you get, uh, well, whatever. Anyway, um, so I would agree that a lot of times with what you're saying here, uh, but I wouldn't agree with it with a launch where you've been spending a month and a half building up to a reveal of a sales letter that you plan on putting up and then taking down, hopefully within an hour or two later because you sold out. So you don't have the chance to test. And um, so I certainly uh, do feel like what you're saying here is more likely the outcome. Um, but... What what I'm trying to do at Agora right now, Hugo, is to put a process in place where we test leads and the copywriter gets that information back within 48 hours. And the reason why is, is that it makes no sense to me for a copywriter to spend a month and a half on a piece of copy that we could test the lead and know within 48 hours whether they should write the next 30 pages or 40 pages or 70 pages of that sales letter. And since, uh, and generally at Agora, if a sales letter fails, it's over, on to another one. So there's, there is no like time to really change it dramatically. So with that stated, what I wanna do is I wanna have a better testing methodology in place so that copywriters kind of have the responsibility of coming up with several leads at a given time. And then we can get back to them on the one that shows the most promise immediately. We are hardwired to avoid danger. So starting with pain is a great lizard brain methodology, especially when you use contrast. And for those who still might not have gotten the answer, the book that I recommended was Resonate by uh, Nancy Duarte for how to build contrast when you use your board you write bullet points under each of the tactics and then give it to a copywriter no i mean i'm choosing each day right so let's go back to this for a second we didn't get very far so let's go back apologize about that uh okay so let's go back here all right so the next one right is possible to probable and this uh, I've learned from Dan Kennedy. Um, don't want to take credit for um, this because I think it's too powerful, although I've seen other people take credit for it, even though it came from Dan Kennedy. Possible to probable. So what's the difference? Well, someone can believe something is possible, right? But they can believe also that while it's possible, it's not probable for them. And one of the biggest obstacles we have when selling to specific markets, especially when it comes to information products, is uh, a lack of belief in oneself, a self-esteem problem, right? So, and we all have it in different places. And unless your name is Harlan Kilstein and you think you are the best at everything and take credit for everything. But let's say that you're not a sociopath and that you have some semblance of reality and therefore you don't think that everything is possible, is probable for you. And if that's the case, right, then what can be done from the marketer standpoint to get you to believe that not only is it possible, but it's probable for you. And so one of the examples that I like to give to illustrate this, and I think I've explained this before, is that the biggest business I've had personally 
It was about $20 million. And uh, I've never had a $100 million business. I've never had a half a billion dollar business. I've never had a billion dollar business. It's not really my aspirations to either. Um, even a $20 million business kept me kind of busy. But, um, but let's say I wanted to have a $100 million business. But let's also, like deep down, I wanted it. And, but I also didn't have any confidence that I could do it. I know it's possible to have a $100 million business. I've seen people do it, right? Um, I've coached people past it. Uh, quite a few, actually. But let's say I didn't. And let's say that the only reference point I had was Michael Masterson, Mark Ford. Um, <laughs> I want to tell this other story. It's so off topic, so I won't. Um, anyway, so... So Mark has had several businesses, numerous businesses over 100 million, several businesses over a billion, right? And he's a mentor of mine, and I have mad respect for him. And so let's say that he said to me, Rich, I think strategic profits could be a $100 million business. And in my mind, I might be like, it might be, but not while I'm running it. Uh, not because I choose not for it to be a $100 million business, but because I don't believe in my own abilities to bring the business to that because I'm very cognizant of the flaws that I have. Um, I don't, I'm a little bit flaky. I don't, I'm non-confrontational and I procrastinate, blah, 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 blah. So while I certainly believe it's possible to have a hundred million dollar business, I certainly believe it's possible for Mark to teach someone to have a hundred million dollar business. I don't believe it's probable for me. So what is going to take me personally, from possible to probable. And that's if Mark can target what it is that I'm using as my rationale as to why it won't happen as a rationale as to why it will happen. And this would require me to talk quite a bit about something I've already spoken about. So I don't necessarily want to go into this and spend the next half an hour just talking about this one technique. But it's here, and for those who have been on these live streams, then you know what I'm talking about. It's this last one here, crystallization on the lower right, where my face is right now. I just moved it. Crystallization is right there. And crystallization is about calling out why the bad things about the... the the behaviors, beliefs, experiences that someone has had only prove that your solution is the right solution that will get them the outcome and that they've currently been following the wrong solution. And we spent a lot about that. Um, so there you go. Um, just really Mr. X. I'm not Mr. X. Um, James Cook is Mr. X. It's funny that you guys mentioned that, though, because um, Jay had asked me years ago. I'm going to grab a piece of cheese real quick, so hold on. Uh, Jay had asked me years ago to update the Mr. X book. I didn't really see a way to do it. Now I do, and he asked me again last night, and I agreed. So I am going to update the Mr. X book to provide digital, like the digital equivalent. Sorry, I'm just so hungry and I didn't eat lunch. Um, but for those of you who want to know who the real Mr. X is, it's Jim Cook. He wrote other books that are really good too. I'm only going to eat half of it. I'll leave the rest till after the live stream. But, uh, yeah, I actually, just to know that I'm not shitting you. I went down to my garage, grabbed one of these, because I bought over a 1,000 of them from Jay to give to clients years ago. Um, I still have a bunch of them in my garage. So I broke out a new one, because I need to read it with new eyes to figure out what to update with it. So I brought this up last night. Kind of funny. Um, funny that one of you guys would mention Mr. X. Anyway, let's press on. Okay. 
what report talks about theory of constraints? It has two names. It's called the entrepreneurial emergency or the uncertainty syndrome. That's because it said in the upper left-hand corner, the uncertainty syndrome. And then I think in the middle, it said the entrepreneurial emergency. Uh, and it's about theory of constraints in a weird way, but it sold uh, somewhere between three and $4 million, I think, of theory of constraints. So certainly did better than... That was one of the things that blew Eli Goldratt alone, uh, away. I had made more in a month teaching theory of constraints than most people who learn theory of constraints are consultants for theory of constraints making a lifetime with it. And it's because of my marketing prowess, not because of my theory of constraints prowess, although I didn't know this stuff pretty well. Uh, happy face, Priya. Cool. Rich, you speak highly of Agora. Could you recommend one of their products as a source we could learn from for their marketing, copywriting, and offers? Um, sure. I would say that look up Legacy Financial and opt into anything that they offer. And they have lots of different gurus from Jeff Clark to Tika. Uh, I forget Tika's last name. Um... Yeah. And look, I, I, I've worked for Agora for a very long time, so that's part of the reason. I think they do a lot of things wrong. I think they do a lot of things right. I, but one thing that you can't argue with is very few people have broken the, the billion-dollar level of selling information, have done it consistently. And um, there are some other things that I know that I can't share right now that will even, like, I if... It was public knowledge. I could add a few things of something that Agora's done that nobody's done in our world. Um, and I think that'll be public knowledge probably within the next 12 months. Um, but legacy, legacy Financial right now is the hot division of Agora. So that would be the ones that I would look at. Yeah, Travis Sago would be great. Okay, well, then I will reach out to him. If you like spin selling... You would really like a book by Michael Oliver, How to Sell Network Marketing Without Fear, Anxiety, or Losing Your Friends. It's selling through normal everyday conversation. Great for today's world online. I'll check it out. Um, it's just that I'm so anti-network uh, marketing. You know, network marketing, what it was originally there for was this, like its popularity at least for a long period of time was because claims could be made from person to person that were not ever going to be kosher printing in a magazine, newspaper, or online. That's changed uh, over the years, right? Um, and I just find, I'm not. that's not to say that some people don't do well in network marketing. I know some that do, but um, more often than not, it's taking advantage of people. The people that do well in it would have done well in their own business and would have owned the asset. Uh, the majority of people obviously don't do well. And um, and then, yeah, the whole butting into conversations to pitch is disgusting. And so it's always left a bad taste in my mouth. And uh, But I will check that out. Uh, because if you can sell that, I guess you could sell anything. Michael Oliver. Side note, thanks for these lives, Rich. You share more value each week than most people in paid courses. Honors to learn from you, brother. Well, thank you, Avilio. Where are you from, man? Uh, let's just say you are not a sociopath. <laughs> uh, after meeting him, I avoided Harlem like the plague, the Middle Ages plague. That is cool. I know I, I've already wasted too much energy on that guy. Uh, let's keep going with this. Okay, so we go from possible to probable by making it clear that we understand our prospect, right? One of the most common compliments I would get from my reports would be prospects would tell me 
wow, it was crazy when I was reading your report. It felt like you were standing right over my shoulder. You were describing my situation. When you can do that, you immediately take someone from possible to probable because you're describing them. And if you're describing them, then you must have the solution for them. So it's very powerful. Uh, next is peg high price, right? So we live in a world where we automatically assume if something's more expensive, it's more valuable. So you want to tie things to a higher price, even if you're going to charge less, right? So one of the ways I've done that, and um, this is the first way I learned from uh, Jeff Walker, and I was kind of surprised it worked so well, but it did. Um, when I did the first launch with the Internet Business Manifesto, um, Jeff shared with me to peg a high price and that I could peg a high price by doing nothing other than, that's weird. Oh, it's just where the light's hitting my head. Um, by mentioning a higher price all the time. So what I did was, is that when I, because no one knew what the price of my coaching program was going to be, what I said was that it was not going to be $25,000, even though that's what my partner, Jay Abraham, charges for each and every seminar that he does. And I'm going to give you two seminars, and I'm going to do the coaching with you and this and that. But I'm still not going to charge you the 25000 And I must have thrown out that 25000 in numerous emails over a period of time. And so it just pegged that price. Later on, after I had figured out a way to do a program, make it personal, charge more, then come back, turn it into an automated product, I could peg it to the price when it was personal. Um, but pegging to a higher price means that you're going to pay less than what everyone else paid for it. Others paid 15 or 25,000 for this. Um, you're only going to pay 3,000 or 5,000. And that is extremely powerful. So, uh, oh, wow. Uh, um, so one night, Jay Abraham called me and said, I have this wonderful idea. I think me, you, and Mark Ford should run ads against Harlan because Harlan has attacked them as well. And I said, no, I don't really want to get into that. Um, when you fight with pigs, you get dirty. And I have no intention of that. But I guess I'm in good company. Can a marketing argument uh, be the USP from the product instead about the unique mechanism? I'm not sure about the way you've worded this question, Gene Carlo. Um, generally, from my perspective, um, cause you're kind of mixing, you're mixing terms here, right? So I think when you say marketing argument, you're probably referring to what Todd Brown teaches and the USP and the unique mechanism from, uh, breakthrough advertising, uh, Gene Schwartz. So I always use a unique mechanism. I also always create a core concept. A core concept is a single idea that if it's believed, it makes the USP the default option. So to go back to that example I gave earlier, Gene Carlo, of the NMN pill, um, about it being coded, and I'm sure there are other ones that sell it being coded too. I'm, you know, uh, I'm just, as I was going across it, I, I came across that and I was like, that was the first one. I, so I took a picture. Um, if, if I believe that in order to get the benefits of NMN, I must have it clear the stomach and get into the small intestine. And I'm just making that up. Uh, if I believe that, then the only the only tablet that's coded to resist against digestive enzymes in your stomach so that it goes into your colon gets fully it goes into your small intestine so it gets fully absorbed um if i believe that then the usp that we sell the only coded tablet 
is very appealing. So the core concept is a belief that if bought into, right, makes the USP the default decision. Then my marketing is going to keep going back and forth, hitting that main point of the core concept because I don't know how many of my messages my prospect is going to see. So I want to make sure every message ties into that core concept. Generally, that core concept is going to negate the options that currently exist, which means I'm going to have to introduce a new mechanism anyway. Um, but it's really much more core concept would be, I guess, the theme of my marketing argument, if you're going to use Todd's language. Um, and then from there, uh, it should dovetail into the USP. So hopefully that helps. And the difference, since like the big idea comes from Agora, but I know Todd has spent a lot of time on that, the difference between a big idea and a core concept is that a big idea has to be sexy in and of itself in the way it is articulated versus like so that when you share it, people lean in and want to know more in a copy-esque kind of way. Whereas the core concept does not have to be that tight, doesn't have to pop, but the concept has to be that powerful. In other words, the idea needs to be as powerful, even if it's even if you can't turn it into a soundbite. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right. Mark Ford is another uh, amazing guy. I loved his feedback. Yes, I agree, Christopher. So Christopher's talking about, I had this uh, mastermind a couple of years ago or a bunch of years ago where I kind of did an anti-mastermind because my belief was like the idea of going somewhere and getting more ideas for someone like me who already has more ideas than they know what to do with and has like part of their problem is coming up with too many ideas that distract me from the ideas I've already kind of settled in on. So because of that, I wanted to do a different type of mastermind. And so the mastermind that I did was I want you to leave with one good idea that you're so confident in that you like focus in on that after each meeting. And so in order to facilitate that, we're going to do four meetings over the course of the year. One of them will be with me alone. The other three will be with my top three mentors that have helped me the most. And those three mentors were Jay Abraham, Clayton Makepeace, and Mark Ford, a.k.a. Michael Masterson. So, uh, so, and C Christopher was in that mastermind, so got to spend a day or a weekend or whatever it was with all three of them. Okay, let's see. Uh, I don't think it's legacy. Well, do they, let's see, does legacy actually, uh, legacy... Uh, research. Yep, that's legacy research. Now just start clicking on stuff, uh, and opt in for stuff. That's it, Asher. I do spin for high tech. What do you mean you do spin? Oh, spin selling for high tech, I guess. Uh, very cool. I thought you were thinking like Peloton spin. <laughs> I am from Miami Homestead, but was born in Cuba. Oh, very cool, man. Well, I get down to Miami quite often. We have a few people here who are in Miami. I'd love to kind of get together with all the Miami peeps. Maybe we could do that uh, one Tuesday or Thursday and actually broadcast from some place in Miami. I was doing those live streams in Miami for a while. I think that'd be kind of cool. Let me know if you guys have an interest in that, and we could kind of try something maybe in a couple weeks. Got to run with the wife, with her Instagram, so great to drop your value bombs. Thanks, Dr. Vogelman. See you next week or on Thursday. Have you always had such a great memory or have you done things to train yourself? And if so, what? I have a really crappy memory, Brian. So I'm kind of, um, I don't remember movies I've seen. I don't, I, I only remember the things that are important to me and most things are not important to me. And so they go in one ear and they go out the other. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily, I have, I have a weird memory. I remember certain things extremely well. Like I can remember, uh, like what book I read something. And generally I can remember if the page is on the left and the right and whether it was far into the book or up front. So I could just basically find it pretty quickly. 
uh, I'm horrible with names. Atrocious. And, uh, and with a lot of other things. So, yeah, I don't have a great memory. And I've not worked on improving it. And, um, but I am thinking about how I've been somewhat complacent personally with where I'm at. I mean, I'm pretty happy with my skill set, what I'm capable of, what I can do, what I can't do. But I haven't really been on a, um, a path of personal improvement in quite some time. And I think that's a mistake and I want to improve. I want to change that. So I actually was writing in my journal last night about that. Like I want to stay, start taking on some personal projects. I want to feel less stagnant. I'm always learning more. So it's not about that. It's not about research and stuff like that or marketing because just based on what I do, I'm always getting better because I'm interviewing all these great people. They're telling me what's working. So that I get better and better without even having to apply myself. But I'm an introvert. I'm not comfortable going over to strangers and just starting conversations. I My memory is pretty crappy. Um, I really feel like maybe I should just lose the weight and get down to 175 and stop having my weight go up and down. Um, maybe I should start working out to actually improve my health, not just not get fat. So these are the kinds of things that I was thinking about last night. But I appreciate the compliment, Brian. Um, uh, Jay Abraham mentioned in one of his books that if you use something in one industry and apply it to another industry, it can have the equivalent of atomic bomb. I see the referral marketing campaign you did many years ago when you gave away bonuses per social share. That was brilliant marketing. Oh, thanks. Well, so how do I pronounce your name? Iman? Iman? So uh, let me share this with you, Iman. And let me share this with all of you. I think like you're, uh, hopefully you guys agree with this. Uh, you got that. This is what I'm about to share is extremely valuable and it's the payoff for sticking with me for the hour and 50 minutes. So Jay does teach that Jay teaches that the, a concept strategy tactic in one industry that is as common as dirt can have the power of an atomic bomb in another industry. What most people think that Jay is talking about is just uh, like a tactic here or a strategy there. Jay is talking about that, but so much more than that. And what I mean by that is, is look at what Jay did as the basis of what how he got his start, how he became Jay Abraham. He was much more than this now, but when he first started, he took the concepts of direct response and applied it to the entrepreneurial market. That's what he did. Ideas as common as dirt, in direct response, he brought them to the entrepreneurial marketplace and they had the power of an atomic bomb. So much so that we all know what affiliates are now. That was a host parasite that, you know, from Jay's vernacular. We all know what lifetime value is. We know all know what cost per acquisition is. These are all concepts that were common as dirt and direct response, but the entrepreneurial market did not know that. And just in case you think I'm revealing a Jay Abraham secret, it's one of the things he teaches, and so he, it's not a secret. And But maybe it's a secret most people don't realize that even what he teaches is that way. But me too. So I took strategies, concepts, and, and methodologies from the big world of consulting, and I brought it to entrepreneurship. Whether it's theory of constraints, whether it's systemization, process mapping, all these things that no one in the market really knew about when I first entered it, all I was doing was taking concepts that were really common in the world of high level strategy consulting and brought it into this world. So it is a powerful, powerful idea, this idea of pulling from one to bring to another. It's the hero's journey, if you think about it as well. And so I think most of us discount the opportunity to do that in so many different ways, but Thanks for reminding me, Ian. Iman, sorry. Uh, where can we learn more about the core concept or where can we get that report? You can watch the video absolutely free. And I think there might even be a link to the report too by joining the Facebook group. 
It's all in the Facebook group, and it's free, Jaden. And we won't even, I don't even think we ask you for your email address, although that will be changing shortly, I imagine. But uh, that's where you can get it all. My gift to you, Jaden. Uh, reading Mark Ford's persuasion book at the moment seems to cover the big idea concept pretty well. Yeah, it does. I would say count me in for the Miami meetup. Very cool. All right. We got to do that. Uh, Hugo's in Miami. I think we got Lisa in Miami and then we've got a bunch of people in the area, so they might want to join us too. Uh, yeah, we could have a little, we could have a whole big meetup. That would be fun. Uh, I'd really like to do that actually. Uh, the, oh, cool. Voice for Dream and Quick Read have changed my life, Rich. Thank you. I read so much and it helps me out a ton. Those are the two programs I use the most, so I'm glad. Uh, Leon, pretty much all you said about the coded pill and USP big idea could be said about the original USP. Yep. Melts in your hands. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands, right? Uh, Rosser Reeves is the inventor of that. Good memory, Leon. Stay safe in New York, man. And come down to Florida when you can. Uh, have I eaten Peruvian food before? Um, I don't know. I don't think I have. That's Brazilian food is like where they bring all the steaks, right? Um, that's not Peruvian. That together in Miami. Yeah, let's definitely do that. I take a plane to Miami just for that meeting. <laughs> well, that's awfully nice of you, Louis. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. I'm here twice a week. Um, all right, guys. So I think it's a good time to end, even though it's five minutes early. Uh, well, we don't have to end. I mean, what I what I meant is um, instead of going any further, let me show you this again, though, so you can take a picture. We didn't get very far. I think let me know if you guys want to go further with this on Thursday. That makes my life relatively easy. What we didn't cover is so much. So I think we should. Um, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what we'll do on Thursday. And now let's go back to me. Uh, what is the best place to begin studying J. Abrams' work? Well, he's he's evolved a lot. So, like, his latest stuff is some of it's a departure from previous stuff. But if you're asking me... Um, you know, I used to listen to Jay all the time. It's why I can write in his voice. It's why you know, he's working on a promo right now. And um, he was telling me the idea behind it. And I'm like, you know, I wrote a promo in your voice using that exact approach. You might just want to copy and paste that. And then I sent it to him. He's like, oh, my God, that's perfect. So, um, and so that was done by me listening to Jay's stuff over and over and over again. I used to have what it was a pre iPad or pre iPods, uh, a Nomad Zen, and I converted all the audio tapes to MP3. And then I would listen in high speed because the Nomad Zen you could. And um, I just had it playing in the background over and over again. But I would say that the best book of his that I ever read, and I've read them all. Um, in fact, the sticking point solution was based on a lot of the work that we did together, which is why he thanks me in the front, uh, is the Mr. X book. And I hate to say it this way because I don't mean any offense by it, but I believe it's the best book of Jay's because he didn't write it. And Jim Cook wrote it, and he's a much more linear thinker. And I would imagine that my best book will probably be by somebody else. Because um, I am also not the most linear thinker. And um, it's one of the reasons why Clayton Makepeace and I became friends, because I had become friendly with him. I asked him if he could do me a favor and kind of look through the Attention Age Doctrine too, because that's what I had been working on, and just recommend to me an order of what to put first, second, third, and fourth, because to me, it was all interrelated. I didn't know what to put first. And Clayton read that, and he was like, I want to rewrite it for you. He's like, this is amazing, and I'm, I want to learn this stuff, and so I'll re I'll uh, I will rewrite it for you. Um, so uh, I'd say that Jay struggles with that same thing. And so because of that, the Mr. X book is the most linear kind of straightforward approach. It's obviously not as up to date, but that is going to be falling on my shoulders to change. 
steaks bringing to the table stuff. That's from Argentina. Yes, that's from Argentina. Okay, yeah. So I don't know if I've ever eaten Peruvian food. So that's one area, guys, that you all know much more than me about. I am horrible at geography. I could not even label all 50 states on the map. Um, you can't know everything. Uh, absolutely would like to go further on the whiteboard session. Cool. Uh, Miyuki. Hey, Miyuki. Good to see you. Thank you for saying thank you. Uh, Nikki, are you going to be in, in the U.S. anytime soon? Is here going to bring you? Uh, ben, yes, that would be great. Me too. Listen to all his videos and podcasts. Dinner's on me. Uh, might be a lot of people. Don't say that, Hugo. Uh, let me know if you ever come to Ireland, Rich. Uh, Iman uh, as is an amen. Oh, cool. Well, oh, you know what? I didn't even turn my lights on today. So hold on. That what's behind me is, um, where is it here? Hold on. What's behind me is uh, in between those two green lights, and I don't know if you can tell, see it even, but uh, that is Conor McGregor's glove uh, that he signed from a fight. So uh, I am a fan of Ireland, and I am so looking forward to Conor coming back. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. thanks Rich you're welcome Lee and what's the best way to connect with you if we could to bounce some ideas on what we're working on with you what do you mean what you're working on with me um, I would say the Facebook group is probably the best Asher uh, thank you for the useful info and Brian another great session thanks Rich Gracias, senor, for your input and continual sharing. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, Manuel. And I guess that's it. So we'll call it a day. Um, sorry for going off too much on Mr. HK. I'm going to try and just forget that person. I don't know why I felt like giving him a couple digs this time. But the more I can just completely forget about that person, the happier I am. And so with that said, have a wonderful week to higher profits and beyond. It's not too late to share this, so by all means do that. If you're not a member of the group, please join the group. It's free, and that's a great way for you to get all the valuable stuff that I give away for free that I charge for elsewhere, but share with my peeps, and I will be following up with you, Hugo, and so have a great day to higher profits and beyond. Rich Sheffrin over and out, and tomorrow we'll be putting on a video on YouTube.